Let us pray. Holy God, in this, your holy sanctuary, we turn to you and ask that you would help us to let go of wandering thoughts and distractions, that we might hear clearly your word to us this day. Speak, Lord, for your children are listening, and unless you speak in this time, nothing of eternal significance shall be heard. In your Son's holy name we pray. Amen. O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. When through the woods and forest glades I wander, and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. Then I shall bow in humble adoration, and there proclaim, My God, how great Thou art. My friends, you know that song. You know that in your heart and in your spirit. And most often we associate it with the crusades of Billy Graham, don't we? But that hymn was actually written in 1886 by a Swedish pastor, Carl Boberg. He happened to be caught in a sudden thunderstorm while he was visiting the beautiful country estate. And as that storm passed, giving way to the sweet song of birds, and the green countryside began glistening in the sunlight, Boberg composed nine original stanzas to that beautiful hymn. It's a hymn that celebrates the beautiful and artistic genius of God revealed to us in nature, in the glory of God's creation. I would dare say that each and every one of you have felt that same sense of awe at one time or another in your life. I know that I feel it every time I go to the beach and see a sunrise or a sunset over the vast ocean. I feel it when I drive through Edgefield County in the early spring and see the beautiful peach trees with their blossoms. I feel it when I'm out in my backyard with my dogs and I watch them running around and playing with their ears flopping and their tongue hanging out with joy and excitement. And I feel it when I wake up in the morning to the still quietness of our house when all I can hear is the beautiful songs of the birds singing outside our bedroom window. And I also feel it when my husband Richard and I take walks in the cool of the evening and when we stop and pause long enough to gaze up into the sky and see the vast twinkling lights of the beautiful stars. When I allow myself to notice these small and constant bits of beauty that have been woven into the fabric of life, I can't help but marvel at the vastness of the beauty in creation. And my hunch is that you can too. Very much like the psalmist who wrote, the earth proclaims the glory of the Lord. You see, the Bible tells us very clearly 
that we should be able to see God's handiwork in creation, in this marvelous universe that God has put into being. And it's not just the land, the sky, and the sea that show forth the fingerprints of God, God's intelligent and wonderful design. We see God's intelligent and wonderful design in the animal kingdom, too. Think about the diversity of creatures, and you will marvel at God's creativity. It just boggles the mind. How many of you watch the Discovery Channel or Animal Planet like I do? And I won't ask how many of you stop when you're scrolling through social media to watch those cute cat and puppy videos because they're the most popular videos on all of social media. Something about God's beautiful animal kingdom attracts us. And we learn things from God's animals. As the proverb that I read to you today proclaims, we learn things from even the smallest of creatures, like the ants, and how they work in unity with one another. Think about whenever you have kicked over an anthill, and then if you pause long enough, you'll see all of the ants banding together immediately, working together to rebuild their home that we have just destroyed. Agar, in writing this proverb, says that we should consider the locust and how powerful they are. Now, if you think about a locust or a grasshopper, one is not very frightening or threatening, is it? But when they band together, when there is a horde of locusts, they are very, very powerful. Some of you may recall from your history lessons that back in 1874, a horde of locusts descended upon the Great Plains in America destroying crops and attacking people so that those homesteaders who had settled there were forced to move. And it is estimated that the lo those locusts did over $200 billion worth of damage to the economy. There is power when small creatures band together. The wise man, Agur, penned those proverbs because he understood that we would do well to learn from God's creation, that there is much wisdom that God has implanted in the world. Things that animals do instinctively are things that God's holy word instructs us to do. And the animal kingdom can remind us of those lessons. They can remind us that when difficulties come our way, we can survive as we band together and rebuild our lives. When you read through the scriptures, from Genesis to Revelation, you can make no mistake that the Bible counts animals in the story of salvation and often portrays them as revealers of God's truth and God's wisdom. The Old Testament book of Job reminds us in the 12th chapter that animals have a handle on some of the wisdom in this world that has passed us by. Job says, Ask the birds, ask the beast, and they will teach you. For by observing animals, both domestic and wild, our feelings and our thoughts can be reshaped and reformed in powerful and wise and positive ways. So in the time we have remaining together with one another in this service, I want to share with you some lessons that I have learned by observing God's animal kingdom and the first of these lessons I call 
Heidi's lesson. My family has always included dogs as part of our family. Last year, our three-legged lab, Heidi, passed away. But Heidi, throughout her life, taught me a powerful lesson about enjoying each day. Seeing each and every day of life as a gift. For although Heidi only had three legs, having been injured in an accident before we adopted her, she ran and jumped and played as if that was normal. I think about people who have illnesses and injuries who allow that to stop them from enjoying life. And Heidi never did. Richard often said, nobody ever told Heidi that dogs were supposed to have four legs. And so she just thought that was normal, and she did enjoy each and every day. It never failed that at 7 a.m. every single day she would wake up ready to run out in the yard and play and jump to do so with gusto, with her eyes wide open to seize the day with energy and excitement. She never tired of the same old, same old every single day. She loved the routine, her walk in the morning, her little treat, her nap, her walk in the afternoon. Every day was like a new day to her, even though it was the same thing every day. And how often do we get bored, sit down and complain about the routineness of life? Heidi taught me to enjoy every day as a gift from God. On the Dog Registry of America website, I read the following commentary that sums up a sermon that I think Heidi preached to me. The commentary is titled, if a dog were to give a sermon, and this is what it says, if a dog were to give a sermon, you might learn stuff like this. When loved ones come home, always run to greet them. Never pass up the opportunity to go on a joy ride. Allow the experience of fresh air and wind in your face to be pure ecstasy. Take naps and stretch before rising. Romp, run, and play. Thrive on attention and let people touch you. Avoid biting when a simple growl will do. On warm days, stop, lie on your back in the grass. On hot days, drink lots of water and lie under a shady tree. When you're happy, Dance around and wiggle your entire body. And no matter how often you're scolded, don't buy into the guilt trip thing and pout, but instead run right back and make friends. Delight in the simple joy of a walk. Be loyal. Never pretend to be something you're not. And if you want lies buried, if you want what lies buried, dig until you find it. And when someone is having a bad day, sit, be silent, sit close by, nuzzle them gently. As I read those lessons, those of you who have pets in your home probably could picture your own pet. These pets teach us those simple lessons of wise living that God has given us the gift of each and every day to enjoy and to embrace and to share with others. The second lesson I believe we can learn from our animal friends is that it's possible to turn life's irritations into treasures. This is a lesson that we learn from oysters. There once was an oyster whose story I tell, who found that sand had gotten under his shell. 
Just one little grain, but it gave him such pain. For oysters have feelings, although they're so plain. Now did he berate the working of fate, which led him to such a deplorable state? Did he curse out the government and call for an election? No. He lay on the shelf and he said to himself, if I cannot remove it, I'll try to improve it. So the years rolled by, as years always do, and he came to his ultimate destiny, Stu. But here's the small sign, and this small grade of sand, which had bothered him so, was a beautiful pearl, all richly aglow. Now this tale has a moral, for it isn't grand, what an oyster, for isn't it grand, what an oyster can do with a morsel of sand? What couldn't we do if only we'd begin with all the things that get under our skin? The Apostle Paul encourages us with that same lesson. When the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Philippi, and he said, that he had learned to be content in whether, whatever circumstances he found himself, not looking back, but pressing forward to the upward calling of God. The oyster reminds us of that wisdom that Paul imparts to us to press on and to endure difficulties and discomforts and irritations in this life, to endure hardships and trials, knowing that our future will be one of glory and joy and peace for all who follow Christ. Earlier today, a reporter from WLTX interviewed some of us, asking how we felt about wearing masks continually, and the mandate to wear a mask in the city. And every one of us that was interviewed was positive. When so many people complain about a little piece of cloth across their face, and yet the people of this great church, I am so proud of you, she asked me that question, how did I feel about this congregation? And I said, I am proud of you. I am filled with love as I see all of you keeping your mask on, enduring whatever irritation that mask might be out of love for one another knowing that as we continue to follow the science, this pandemic can end. Knowing that as we continue to follow the science, we're sharing love and taking care of one another. The animal kingdom, in so many ways, can show us how surviving hardships are possible when we band together and when we do things with one another. The third lesson that I've learned from the animal kingdom is that animals give us the opportunity to practice what it means to be truly human. When I first arrived here at Washington Street Church, I was told about the cats of Washington Street. Do any of y'all recognize the names Penny and Quarter and Cha-Ching and Swerve? The names of the cats who live here at Washington Street Church and the wonderful ministry of Darby and her family. A young lady in this congregation who saw these cats multiplying and wanted to catch the feral cats and take care of them and how this community banded together. When I read the story of the Washington Street Cats, it reminded me of another story that I heard on NPR several years ago on NPR's Weekend Edition. It was told by a man by the name of Troy Chapman, and this is what Mr. Chapman had to say. He said, when Scruffy the orange cat showed up in the prison yard, I was one of the first to go out there and pet it. I hadn't touched a cat or a dog in 20 years, and I spent at least 
20 minutes crouched down by the dumpster behind the kitchen as that cat rolled around and luxuriated beneath my attention. What he was expressing outwardly, I was feeling inwardly. It was amazing that this bit of orange fluff was a bit of grace, grace to me, feeling him under my hand and how enriched my life was by this other creature was something as simple as a touch and care. I believe that caring for something or someone in need is what makes you human. Over the next few days, I watched as other prisoners responded to the cat. Every yard period, a group of prisoners gathered there behind the dumpster, behind the kitchen. They stood around talking and taking turns petting that cat. These were guys you wouldn't usually find talking with one another. Several times I saw an officer in the group not chasing the people away, but just watching and seeming to enjoy the interaction of the prisoners and this cat. Bowls of milk and water appeared along with bread wisely placed under the edge of the dumpster to keep the seagulls from getting it. The cat was obviously astray and in pretty bad shape. But one prisoner brought out his small, blunt-tipped scissors and trimmed away the burrs and the matted fur from his coat. People said, that cat came to the right place. He's getting treated like a king. And that was true. But as I watched, I was also thinking about what the cat was doing to us. There's a lot of talk about what's wrong in prisons in America today. We need more programs. We need more psychologists and treatments of various kinds. And that is true. Some even talk about making prisons more kind. But I think what we really need is a chance to practice kindness ourselves. Not receive it, but learn how to give it. After more than two decades here, I know that kindness is not a value that's encouraged in prison. It's often seen as a weakness. Instead, the culture in here, and I dare say in the world, encourages a keep your head down, mind your own business, never let yourself be vulnerable attitude. But for a few days, a raggedy cat disrupted this code of prison culture. They've taken him away now and hopefully found him a warm and welcoming home. But it did my heart good to see the effect he had on me and on the other men here. He didn't have a PhD, he wasn't a criminologist, he wasn't a psychologist, but by simply saying, I need some help here, he did something important for us. He needed us, and we all need to be needed. My friends, animals can teach us so much. The first chapter of the book of Genesis in the Bible says, Let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things, wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. And God saw it. And it was good. These gifts of creation have given us so much and continue to give. We learn from them and we can continue to learn from them if we will take the time to slow down and observe and enjoy their presence in our lives. They often shape how we think and how we feel, how we respond, and they help us to care. Sometimes it may even feel like their actions are actually talking to us. And I believe they are. So when they do, may we all take the time to listen and to learn from them. 
We will have an opportunity as a congregation this coming Saturday from 10 until noon as Austin and I gather in the parking lot to bless animals. We're inviting you to encourage your friends and family members and neighbors and for you yourself to bring the animals that live with you to share in celebrating the gift that animals can teach us as we bless them. We'll have representatives here with information about how we can adopt animals in this community and take better care of them. And we'll have the opportunity to give that care by making donations to the animal shelters. May God grant us the grace and the courage to continue to give thanks for God's glorious creation. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.